So what do you do when you've looked into it and the child clearly does not have visual stress, okay? They don't have visual stress, also known as Erlen syndrome, also known as scotopic sensitivity. They don't have that. And when you've looked into it, the child does not have phonological dyslexia. And you've, you know what to look for, you've checked into that. No, they don't have phonological dyslexia either. Well, what do you do in that spot? And that's a spot that I often find myself in with the, some of the private consulting that I do. It's like, well, it's not, it's not visual stress, it's not phonological dyslexia, what is it? So let's have a look at some of the things that could be, things that are worth checking out. Um, the first thing to check out is, does your child actually just need glasses for some straightforward vision issues? So it would be great if every child would go and see an optometrist every year or two. And, you know, as a teacher, you don't have control over that. But at the very minimum, you can have a child try to read some very small text on the other side of the, you know, on the other side of the room, further away from you, so that you can tell pretty quickly, does that child have, you know, the eyesight ability to be able to read things that are a little bit far away? Uh, if they can, great. You know, if you can see, if you wear glasses, make sure you're wearing your glasses. If you can see something on the other side of the room, then the child should be able to. And if they can't, that indicates that they need glasses for long distances. In the same way, if the child has got a piece of paper in front of them with really tiny text, but you as an educator can read that text, then the child should be able to read that text. And if the child can't read that text because of the size of it, then again, that, that child needs to go to an optometrist, probably needs glasses for short distance stuff. For, for short distance stuff, it's really easy. You just go down the photocopying room at your school or whatever you call it at your school where you can photocopy text and you just photocopy a page of a book into a tiny fraction of its original size. And even before I knew how to use photocopiers, I knew how to half the size of a page. So I would just half a page, then half it again, then half it again. And I'd end up with this really tiny text. Also, if you're doing this for kids, don't ask them to, to read out words that are written either at a distance or nearby. Just print out letters because that way it's not a test of their reading. It's a test of their eyesight, which is actually what you want to do. Now, a couple of years ago, I was teaching a very young class. It was a year two class. And at the start of the year, I just got in my head to have a bit of an experiment. And I checked out every child for can they read these letters that are a long distance away and can they read these tiny letters right in front of them. And I found that three of the children out of 27 in my class, three of them needed either glasses for short distance or long distance. So this is a very worthwhile thing and and I encourage you that if the next step is, if it's not dyslexia, eyesight's the next thing to look at. If it's not that, then the next thing is a hearing test because children who can't hear all the sounds properly are going to have a lot of trouble with their reading. They're also going to have a lot of trouble with their spelling. And again, that can sort of appear to be dyslexia and, and it's not. Sometimes it's just a hearing issue. So it's just a matter of asking the parent to take their child, get a hearing test because it's worth doing. It's fairly cheap. Uh, and why would you not do that? Another reason why a child may have symptoms that indicate dyslexia, but it's not dyslexia, is that often these children, they just come from a background where they didn't have much parental interaction with them when they were young. They didn't have mum or dad spending a lot of time with them, chatting with them, reading books with them, and that's bad for their vocabulary. And that's bad just for their attitude towards even reading itself. And often just a poor history of of just parents who just didn't take the time that can come across and create symptoms that are similar to, to having dyslexia. So that's something else to keep in mind. Another th possibility is that maybe the child just had a terrible teacher for the first couple of years of school. And we've, we've all seen this before. The worst teacher in the district has been teaching a child and then the next year they're off to another teacher who's really not a great teacher. And then the next year they, they have an okay teacher for the first six months and then suddenly they're the teacher went off on, on maternity leave or whatever so they could have kids and, and then the, the child's being taught by someone who really doesn't know what they're doing and there's been no consistency, there's just been no sort of intervention early when the child needed it. So sometimes it could just be that the child's had a bad round of teachers and lucky they've got you because obviously you're a great teacher or you wouldn't be interested in this course. It's, it's something to keep in mind. And then something else that often can come across as people say, oh, my child has dyslexia and they don't, is when the child has a working memory issue. Now, people get scared, oh, working memory issue. Oh, quick, send them off to a psychologist. Look, it's not that hard. Basically, the idea is that all of us can keep track of a couple of things in our head. And 
if you have trouble remembering your your partner's mobile phone number, it's probably because there's too many digits in that phone number for you to remember. So it took me about seven years to learn my wife's phone number. Go figure. And the reason for that is that my wife's phone number has 10 digits in it. Now, my working memory is obviously not built to keep track of 10 things at the same time. And so I've been told, I haven't really checked it out, it doesn't really matter, that most people, they, they can hold on to seven or eight bits of information at the same time. But the, the issue is that a child with a working memory issue can't keep track of as many bits of information at the same time. It doesn't mean you need to run off and do a heap of psychological tests. If they've got the ability to only keep track of a few things at the same time, that's fine. Just don't give them a list of 40 things to learn. Just give them smaller lists. But that's something that can masquerade as dyslexia. And it's not. It's just you just change what you're doing with them in the class. You, If you're giving them a list of things to do, you write it down for them. And that's not hard. You write on the board or, or you use visual clues, you know, pictures to remind them of the routine or whatever. But if you're struggling to work out what's going with a child, that's another thing to look at. So just recapping what those things were. The first thing is check if the child has vision issues, you know, just needs an optometrist. Check if the child needs a hearing test. Um, ex- except that if the, child, um, if the child has got a situation where they've had minimal exposure to basically good parenting, to parents who are interacting with them when they were young, that can be part of it. Maybe the child just had a terrible teacher for a few years or maybe there's a working memory issue. Now, if it's not one of those things, then, you know, it could be something else. But at the end of the day, they're the most common thing.